My name's Dr Val Curtis and I teach on several master's courses at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, both here in London and by distance learning. My research and my teaching is all about the prevention of infectious diseases. I find it extremely shocking that whilst only 5% of all deaths in developed countries are due to infections, 65% of people in Africa die from infections and 35% in Asia. That big gap is a gap we really need to close. And to do that, we need to get much cleverer about infection prevention. So how can we become cleverer at solving this problem? Our research has shown that one of the best means of preventing infection is also the simplest. Whilst most people focus on high-tech interventions like drugs or vaccines, we found that the simple act of hand washing with soap is more effective at preventing disease than any single intervention. Hand washing with soap could save over a million lives a year. It could prevent almost a half of all deaths from diarrhoea and a quarter of all cases of respiratory infection. In fact, the promotion of hygiene was recently shown by WHO and by the World Bank to be the single most cost-effective disease prevention intervention of all. So, if hand washing with soap is such a good idea, why doesn't everybody do it? We explored why in 11 different countries, including China, India, Madagascar and Kyrgyzstan. Um, we found a variety of reasons. One was that people just didn't feel that their hands were contaminated after the toilet. They didn't smell bad and they didn't look bad. So they felt no desire to wash them. Another was that hand washing was just not a habit. And another was that hand washing with soap was not a local norm. It's just not what we do around here, said one mum to us. Mothers all cared deeply about their children, but they didn't connect safe hand washing with the loving and caring for their child. Almost every family had soap at home, only it wasn't used for hand washing, it was used for clothes and for body washing. So, armed with the deep insights from this research into hand washing, we started to work on designing programmes to promote it. First of all, we went to the soap companies. They are great experts at getting people to buy hygiene products. And they advised us about how to develop professional marketing campaigns using mass media and village roadshows. So, for example, in Ghana, we worked with the National Water Supply Agency, with Unilever and with G-Trade, which is a local soap company, to design ads. These were aired three times a day, three times a week, for six months. The ads were based on our insights that disgust and nurture were important drivers of hand-washing behaviour. The ads showed a mother coming out of the toilet with contaminated hands and then contaminating the food that the child then ate. The campaign was really successful. It created a sense of shock, and strong emotion, and it increased reported hand washing before eating in Ghana by 41%. Despite these successes, astonishingly little is still known about what it takes to change people's behaviour, be it in hygiene or in the prevention of other diseases such as malaria or HIV. So our focus in recent years has been on developing updated theories of behaviour change based on an evolutionary understanding of the purposes of behaviour, and then in testing those theories in the real world. So, for example, we've shown that the emotion of disgust probably evolved as a hygiene instinct. The reason we feel disgust from bodily fluids, worms, signs of sickness, is that it's an innate defensive reaction. It's a sort of X-ray vision that detects pathogen threats in the environment and in other people. We've also shown that if you elicit disgust using messages such as don't take the toilet with you, it gets more people washing their hands with soap in motorway service stations. We're now working on building a behaviour lab in India, which will be a mobile facility that can go out to schools and to villages, and it can test different types of hygiene promotion messages so that we can learn what really works to change behaviour in situ in the real world. We hope this will provide much needed information about how best to help people save themselves from infectious diseases. There's lots of practical research like this going on at the London School of Hygiene, work that has a direct impact on what governments do, on what international agencies such as UNICEF and the World Bank do, and work that has an impact on what NGOs do as well. Students at the school get a direct insight into the latest thinking about disease prevention. I tell my students that such knowledge gives them the power to become cleverer about infectious disease control. I tell them, we need them to become the future leaders in public health. Leaders who will work tirelessly to reduce that shocking disease gap between rich and poor countries.